a sneaky snake, and this kind of a snake is called a python. Maybe you have seen this kind of a snake before in the zoo, or maybe close to a river near where you live. Let me tell you about this snake. This snake likes to wrap himself all the way around your body and break your bones and crush you and then swallow you whole. Oh, boys and girls, this snake reminds us of Satan, who is the father of lies. We need to stay away from him, don't we, boys and girls? Okay, so we are going to be talking about Satan as the father of lies. And that brings us to commandment number nine tonight. Remember, Miss Heather's been teaching you all of God's 10 important rules. And commandment number nine is do not lie. But before then, let me introduce myself to you in case you have never met me before. My name is Miss Heather, and I am happy to introduce you tonight to Hope in God Bible Club. Yes, boys and girls, and let me be the first one to welcome you and say, we're so glad you're here. Yes, we are. Well, one day, Miss Heather was reading her Bible, and I came across this verse in the middle of the Bible in the book of Psalms, chapter 78, verse 7. And that's where I got the name for Hope in God Bible Club, because it has those words in the middle of the verse. What do you think makes you hope in God? Well, let's read the verse together. It says that they, talking about all of you beautiful children from all over the world, might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God that keep his commandments. Yes, boys and girls. So, of course, we know that keeping God's commandments does not save us, but they show us the right way to live so that we can have a wonderful life and so that we can make good friends and so that we can be successful. Well, at this time, let me tell you about our friends, Seth and Ruth. Yes, our puppets have been riding horses tonight and I know they're really busy, but let me see if I can get their attention because I think they have a very important song they want to share with us. So let me go back and see. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Hi, boys and girls. My name is Seth. Oh, you're a good looking bunch of boys and girls. And let me introduce you to my sister. Hi. My name is Ruth, and we're going to be sharing this song with you. Tell the truth. Here goes. As I was riding underneath the sky, my heart was
truth is known. Tell the truth, never tell a lie. Oh, tell the truth, till the day you die. Bye-bye, boys and girls. We're going to get back to riding horses. Oh, boys and girls. I'm so very, very happy that our puppets sang about commandment number nine tonight. It reminds me to tell the truth and not to lie. Well, we are going to be talking about that in just a few minutes. But first, we are going to be talking to God in prayer. Now, you know if you've been with Miss Heather before that every time we meet, we like to do a little bit of world geography and we travel around the world with our prayers. Yes, we do. And we are going to be praying again for this little country of Israel. It is right here on the map. I hope that you can see where my finger is pointing where the red circle is. Yes, so we have Saudi Arabia over here to the right of Israel and to the left of Israel we have Egypt. Yes, so boys and girls, there is a very terrible war going on, a time of fighting right now in Israel and some very evil people have snatched away from their homes 220 children and adults. Yes, mommies and daddies and grandparents who were taken away and they were put under the ground in a network of tunnels where no one can see them. So, they were kidnapped. I want you to think with Miss Heather, how would you feel if you were one of those children and you couldn't be at home, you couldn't sleep in your bed, you couldn't see your mommy and daddy, and you were with some very evil people that had knives and guns and people that don't know the love of God. So that is why we are going to be praying for them tonight. And a group of people like that, that is kidnapped against their will, they are called hostages. So we are going to be praying for the hostages tonight. Okay, so let's bow our heads and close our eyes at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for everything that you are to us. We thank you that you are a refuge in the time of storm. And you know the love that I have for Israel and for your chosen people and the love that I have for all these boys and girls in Hope and God Bible Club from all over the world. At this time, as these boys and girls pray with Miss Heather, we all come to you and we ask you to please protect all of these 220 hostages. Please comfort these children and adults and grandparents. Please be a refuge to them. Please save them. Please love them. And please help no evil or harm to come to them until they can be rescued. Please be with the Israeli soldiers and the United States soldiers as we work together to bring these people back to freedom. And I pray, dear God, that you will be with us tonight as Miss Heather teaches. Fill me with your Holy Spirit power. Help this lesson to be fun and exciting. And I pray that each child would be able to pay attention and stay focused so that we can learn how we can be happy and successful in this world and in the world to come. And so that we can also learn 
how that we can be saved from our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying with Miss Heather, boys and girls. Yes, we serve a mighty God, and he does hear and answer our prayers. Boys and girls, the name of our lesson tonight is called Be a Truth Keeper. Don't be a liar. Today, Miss Heather will be talking about commandment number nine. Can you count to nine with Miss Heather? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll put Pinky down. Oh, good job, boys and girls. Okay. Now, what does God tell us not to do in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16? God tells us, let's read it together. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Let me explain it to you. Don't go away. Okay. So, let's find out what God is trying to tell us to do. Do not bear means you should not carry this type of talking with your mouth. Then it says, do not bear false witness. A false witness is someone who is not telling you the truth. They are telling you a lie. Yes. Then it says, do not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Okay. So this is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. So your neighbor can be anyone, not just someone who lives in the house next door to you or in front of you or behind you. So, in other words, we are not to lie to any person. Also, very importantly, we are not to believe a liar. Have you ever wondered where lying came from? We're gonna find out. So, I want you to open up your Bibles and I want you to turn to the book of John. Now, John is book number four in the New Testament. So, go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you come to chapter eight and go down to verse 44. And this is what it says. God tells us, ye, meaning all of you, are from your father, the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer, that means someone who thinks about killing someone and then they go and do it. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. You may be thinking, well, I have a father who lives in my house. What does it mean that we are of our father, the devil? Miss Heather will be explaining how the first woman, Eve, and this is Eve, boys and girls, listened to and believed Satan's lies. So, you see Satan who came in the form of this serpent or snake to eat. Yes, I'm going to tell you the details about that in just a minute. It's very interesting. So, Eve forgot what God said because she listened to Satan, the father of lies. And then she herself sinned against our holy God, the one and only true God. So, what is sin, you might be thinking? Well, good question. Sin is failing to do what is right. It is anything we do that is wrong, like lying, stealing, bullying others. It is rebellion against God. We have all been born sinners since 
Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman, sinned in the Garden of Eden. To hear about the entire creation story, including where sin came from and like what was created on each day of the week, you may look back at some of my former Hope in God Bible Club videos, and you can find those on YouTube and Bit. Shoot, we are going to be sharing with you those channels at the end of our commandment number nine lesson today. But in this lesson, we are gonna find out about how the first lie happened. Travel with Miss Heather way back in Bible history to the beginning of the world. That was about 6,000 years ago, boys and girls. Now, if someone tells you that the world is millions and billions of years old, that, <laughs> That, my friend, is a lie. Because if you go through each generation, that means each family in all of Bible history, and trace it all the way back to the first family, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, then you can find out for yourself. The earth is approximately 6,000 years old. So, Let's turn to the first book in our Bible, Genesis. Now, Genesis means the book of beginnings. Yes. So, after God created all the beautiful flowers and trees and all the stuff you see on the flannel graph behind this header, God then created man and woman. And then God married the first man, Adam, to the first woman, Eve. He gave them this beautiful garden that they named the Garden of Eden to live in. Now this garden probably had thousands of trees. However, God talks in this verse that I'm going to share with you in just a minute about two very special treats. You might see them on each side of me as well. One tree, this tree over here, reminds us that God is the way to eternal life. This tree is called the tree of life. Can you say that with Miss Heather? The tree of life. And I have written that here. Tree of life, Jesus, who is God. That's who that tree reminds us of. So, we know that the one and only true God is the true witness. And he is the spirit of truth. And God always tells us the truth. There is not one single lie in the Bible. This is the only book that we can trust in the whole wide world because there are no lies in the Bible because the spirit of the living God is in every word of this book. Now, boys and girls, there's another important tree that God talks about in the Garden of Eden as well. And this is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the tree of death. And it reminds us of Satan, the father of lies. Yes. And it reminds us of physical and spiritual death that resulted from believing Satan's lies. So let's look very carefully at Genesis. Go to chapter 2 and go down to verse 9 and follow along with me. It says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree... That is pleasant to the sight, yes, and good for food, yum, yum. The tree of life, 
That's this tree, boys and girls. Also in the midst, that means in the middle of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this tree reminds us of lying spirits and how that Satan is the false witness. Yes. So, let's see what God says about these trees. Yes, and let's look now at Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. It says, And the Lord God took the man, that is, Adam, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but, except for one, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, no. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Oh dear. So, God told Adam and Eve the truth. But, Satan, who came up to Eve, hmm, in the form of a snake, lied to Eve. Who do you think Eve will listen to and believe and obey? God or Satan? Hmm, the father of lies. Well, let's find out. This is so exciting. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. So go over to the next chapter, please. And look at verse 1. The first verse of chapter 3. Now the serpent, that is another name for snake, was more subtle. That means tricky than any beast in the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, see he's in this um, forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right here. So he says to Eve, to the first woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, this is where Satan lies to Eve now. Open your ears, boys and girls. Satan said the exact opposite of what God had just told Adam and Eve. Satan says to Eve, Ah, oh, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, boys and girls, you and I already know that God taught Adam and Eve right from wrong. That Satan always wants to either twist God's word or just tell us an outright lie. So, <clears throat> what choice do you think Eve made? She Is she going to listen to God, the truth keeper, or Satan, the liar? We will find out starting in Genesis chapter 3 and go to verse 6, please. <clears throat> so here we go. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to
to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. Yes, she did, boys and girls. So, maybe it was an apple, like Miss Heather is holding in her hand. My husband and I actually picked these apples from a pretty apple orchard near Glassy Mountain in the state where we live, South Carolina. So the Bible doesn't really say that it was an apple, but we do know that it was a beautiful piece of fruit to look upon. And it looked very, very delicious. But I think Eve's main problem was is that she was listening to the wrong voice. What do you think? Yes. So I'm going to put the apple down right there. So she took the fruit thereof and did eat and also gave it to her husband. And he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they didn't have any clothes on. Oh my goodness. And they hurried up and sewed some fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about this as we go along. So. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I, I, I just commanded you that you should not eat of this tree? And the man said, The woman that thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent the father of lies. He hath beguiled me, and I did eat. In other words, she said, Satan, it's his fault. Yep, he tricked me. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So, the serpent cannot walk anymore with feet and legs. He had to crawl on his belly. And then, God promised Adam and Eve something very precious. God had mercy on them. God promised that through another woman that would be born into the world in the future, and we know that her name was Mary, that God would come down from heaven in the flesh in the form of a little tiny baby, and we celebrate baby Jesus at Christmas, and that he would be born to be our Savior, and that God was going to crush the serpent's head. You know, that's the only way to kill a snake is to chop his head off. And that God was going to have the victory on the cross over sin, over Satan, over hell, the lake of fire, and over death. Yes. So God made this promise. But God told the woman, because you disobeyed me, I am going to multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. 
So in sorrow, you shall bring forth children. Now, children are the joy. Yes, children we love. Children make us very, very happy. But God said, in sorrow, you're going to bring forth children. So while a woman is trying to birth a baby and get it to come out of her body, it is very painful. So that's what God is talking about. So, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Because Eve was deceived. Adam willingly sinned because he loved his wife. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So boys and girls, think with me. God gave Adam the responsibility to work hard and to take care of his family like every man should do. And it wasn't going to be easy like it was in the Garden of Eden to plant and grow things. Why? Follow along with me in verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Have you ever gone to pick a rose and your hand got pricked with thorns? Yes. And have you ever tried to grow a garden and it seems like the weeds are growing faster than your corn on the cob? How is that? That is because of this curse that God gave to Adam for his sin and to future generations. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face, you know, you get hot and sweaty when you're out in your garden working, shalt thou eat bread. <clears throat> yes, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. That means, until the day you die. <clears throat> For out of it wast thou taken... Yes, for dust thou art, God made man out of the dust of the ground, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Okay, so we are going to talk about this for just a minute. God tells us, do not tell a lie and do not listen to a liar. Because Eve believed Satan, the father of lies, instead of the God of truth. Adam and Eve had to leave their beautiful garden. Adam and Eve lost their light. Did you notice the light that was on Adam and Eve before they sinned, boys and girls? That was the Shekinah glory of God. The light that lit up all the world before God even made the sun, moon, and stars. Yes, they lost the Shekinah glory of God and were ashamed of their sin and need for a covering. But we are going to find out now that these fig leaves were not a proper covering for Adam and Eve. So, at this time, we are going to read about them leaving the garden. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, and we are going to start in verse 21. And to Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin. Those were animal skins, boys and girls. And that is what he clothed them with. So now they had a proper covering. Yes. So. And the Lord God said, 
Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. So let's take Adam and Eve down off of our flannel graph board. God drove them out of the garden and he placed on the east of Eden, that's the garden of Eden, cherubims. Cherubims are one of the names of the types of angels that are in heaven and on earth, even though you can't see them right now. So God placed cherubims here and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Let Miss Heather explain a little bit more about that at this time. So God in his mercy promised to be their perfect blood sacrifice for sin so that Adam and Eve and you and I could be forgiven and saved from hell, that terrible lake of fire where all the lost people go. Until then, God provided a temporary covering of animal skins, which required bloodshed. We no longer live this way. We no longer need to do sacrifices because Jesus kept his promise almost 2,000 years ago to die, spilling out his blood, his perfect blood. You see, boys and girls, God never, ever sinned. And he did not get his blood from his earthly mother and father because the Holy Spirit came down to put the seed of Jesus in Mary's womb. So, <clears throat> we no longer need to do sacrifices. Because Jesus came to die, spilling out his perfect blood for us, for you and me. And then he rose again to pay for our sins punishment with his blood. You may ask, why did they have to leave the beautiful garden? And why did it have to be guarded by the angel with the flaming sword, as you see right here on the side of Miss Heather? I hope you can see it. Let me stand up so you can see that a little bit better. Okay, let me explain. The reason why is because God did not want them to eat from the tree of life and live forever in their sins. He wanted to save them first. Then he allowed them to die as punishment for their sins. People die physically, but... <clears throat> All those that have asked Jesus to save them from their sins will live forever in heaven with God, who is the way, the truth, and the life, in a place that is not spoiled with sin. The tree of life reminds us of constant fellowship with God. And that's the kind of fellowship that Adam and Eve had with God before they sinned. But after they sinned, when they believed Satan, the father of lies, then they disobeyed God. Sin brings spiritual death and separation from God. You know, boys and girls, it tells us in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Now you might say, that's a big word, Miss Heather. What does wages mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll be happy to explain. 
If you go cut grass for your neighbors in your neighborhood, they will pay you money when you are finished with the job. That is your wages, your money that you earned for working hard for cutting the grass. Well, all of our works, the Bible tells us, before we get saved are sinful. They are not acceptable to God. So the wages for our sin, remember God told Adam and Eve they were gonna die? He didn't just mean physically. He was also talking about spiritually, that they would die forever. <clears throat> so it says the wages of sin is death. That means we're all headed to the lake of fire before we meet Jesus. But this is the hopeful part of the verse. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when we get saved and we receive God's gift by believing what the Bible says, then we can have hope in God. And we can go with God to stay with him in heaven and live there forever and ever and ever. Well, Adam and Eve should have chosen to eat from the tree of life instead of from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life reminds us if we get saved, we can live with God forever. Remember, boys and girls, that Jesus is God. Let's talk about the tree of life for just a minute. I love to talk about the tree of life. Revelation chapter 2 verse 5 tells us that we will eat from the tree of life in heaven. Do you know how many fruits are on the tree of life in heaven? There are 12 fruits, one different type of fruit that will grow for each month of the year. And I hope you have learned at school that there are 12 months in a year. Well, God helps us to be overcomers, it tells us in this verse, in Revelation 2.5, and to live by Christian character after we get saved. These fruits remind us that through Jesus Christ, who is God, we can overcome sin and live by the spiritual fruits on this tree. So at this time, I am going to talk about what fruits are on this tree. Now, we know that these are also called the fruits of the Spirit. I do not have 12 of them on my tree, but there will be 12 fruits on this tree in heaven. First of all, we have joy. When we get saved, that doesn't mean that everything that happens to us is going to be happy. But that means even when something sad happens, we know that we still have the joy of the Lord that is our strength. And it bubbles up in our soul. God tells us we also have peace. Jesus says in the world we will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I, that's talking about Jesus, has overcome the world. And he will give us peace on earth when we get saved. He will give us peace in our soul. Instead of having a noisy soul, we will have a quiet soul. Gentleness. God helps us to be gentle ladies and gentle men, not to treat people in a rude or rough way but in a mannerly way. Do you use your manners, boys and girls? Do you say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir? We should. Then God says he will give us long suffering. That is suffering with patience. Maybe you have a disease that is not going away as soon as you want it to, or a broken bone, or like these hostages that are in captivity. As Christians, even in the most horrible of circumstances, like Paul and Silas that were put in prison for their faith in the book of Acts in the Bible, they were still able to sing and praise God, 
even though they had been beaten. So God helps us to suffer with patience, even at times when we don't feel like it. Then God gives us faith. Oh, that's a very important one, boys and girls. It takes faith to believe in God. Really, it takes faith to believe in anything. After all, would you step in an airplane if you didn't have faith that it was going to take you across the ocean? If you thought it was going to crash, would you really get in that airplane? Oh, I don't think so. Then God teaches us goodness as Christians. We want to, to do good things for other people. We want to help other people. We don't want to be selfish. And then God gives us temperance. Temperance is allowing the Holy Spirit to control you by the things that you think about, how you spend your time, how you treat other people, and even how you treat yourself. Okay, and then God helps us to have meekness. That does not mean that you are weak. Instead, it means that you are strong in the Lord. You have controlled strength. In other words, you might feel like lashing out and getting angry at someone, but the Holy Spirit says, oh, don't say that word, or don't speak in that way to that person. That's, um, hmm, well, that's not exactly kind. Whoops. I know we all have those struggles. And then the Bible says the greatest of all these things is love. God is love. And when we get saved, he puts a love in us that we have never had before. That kind of love is called agape love. And it is a Christian love where we can even love people that are not lovable, that are not kind to us. That's right. So, boys and girls, when we receive the truth of salvation, we can live like this now and forever. Oh, that's so wonderful, isn't it? So, the tree of life reminds us of God who cannot tell a lie. That's right, boys and girls. Titus 1-2 tells us that the God that created this world cannot tell a lie. He is a truth keeper. Either you're telling a lie or you're telling the truth. God only tells us the truth in the Holy Bible. He is the only true way to heaven. Now, what does the tree of the knowledge of good and evil remind us of? It reminds us of Satan. The father of lies who invites us to sin. Adam and Eve had a choice to make. And so do you. What kind of fruit does Satan offer us from this tree? Oh my goodness, boys and girls. Satan offers us lying spirits from this tree. Oh my goodness, commandment number nine tells us, do not lie. Well, Satan tries to get sin to look good so that he can trap us the way he trapped Adam and Eve. Well, what's another sin on this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Fighting. I see fighting right there like bullying and hitting. No, boys and girls, you are not better than someone else. Just like you want your way, so does the person that you're bullying want their way. God loves us all the same. And we need to respect each other and treat each other the way that we want to be treated. Do not bully. That's what Satan wants us to do. Don't listen to that sneaky, snaky father of lies. Another fruit I see on this tree is 
yes, is idolatry, worshiping false gods, like gods that are made out of wood or stone. Boys and girls, why would you even want to pray to a God that does not see you and cannot hear you and cannot answer your prayers? There are many false gods in the world today. Even some people set themselves up as false gods, like Joseph Smith and Hare Krishna and Allah. But God tells us he is the one and only true God. Another fruit I see on this tree is wrath or anger. God does not want us to be angry with other people or ourselves. Another fruit I see on this tree is hatred. That is also a very bad fruit. That is the opposite of love, boys and girls. God does not want you to hurt yourself or someone else, like in the form of cutting or shooting or, I mean, God just doesn't want us to go there. No, boys and girls, God is a God of love and he wants us to love one another the way that he loves you. Another thing that Satan wants us to do is to murder, to plan to kill, and then to follow through with your plan and go kill someone. That is terrible. No, boys and girls, God doesn't want you to kill someone else or yourself because the reason why Satan wants you to do that is so he can take you to hell, to the lake of fire. Don't fall into that trap either. Then, there's something else that Satan wants us to fall in, to this other sin. And we hear a lot about this sin around this time of the year, around Halloween. That is the devil's holiday. Christians do not and should not celebrate Halloween. That is called witchcraft. That is literally Satan worship. Boys and girls, casting spells like what you might see on a movie or on your phone or in a quote unquote game like a Ouija board, that is evil. That is wicked that is another trap Satan really wants you to fall in because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. So, boys and girls, um, let's go back and review that from John, the verse that I shared with you at the beginning of the lesson. It says, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Don't let someone tell you you need to go to a fortune teller to have your palm read because all these things are from Satan and will bring about death in your life physically. If you don't listen to Miss Heather, you might fall into the trap of these sins and you might die as a very young child, if you do not take this warning. Boys and girls, <clears throat> Satan also wants to attack the spiritual part of you that lives forever called your soul. 
So you are going to live forever somewhere. You are going to decide that. Are you going to choose Jesus, the God of all truth, so that you can go to heaven and eat from the tree of life? Or are you going to choose Satan and death and hell for your eternity? So, that is the most important question anyone will ever ask you in your entire life. So now, let's get back to Adam and Eve quickly. Now, when they ate the fruit from the forbidden tree, their eyes were opened. And instead of thinking good thoughts about God, they started to do what was right in their own eyes. Well, the Bible tells us that in the book of Judges, chapter 17, verse 6, it says, <clears throat> In those days, there was no king in Israel. That is the country we just prayed for tonight, where the hostages were taken. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's what we're seeing right now happen in Israel. Hamas, those are Muslim people that believe in a false god named Allah, they went and attacked and killed many children in unspeakable and gruesome ways and their parents. Hundreds, maybe over a thousand people were killed and 220 were taken as hostages. Why? Hamas is following Satan. They are demon-possessed. They are eating from the fruits on this tree, the lust of the flesh. They are following the false witness, Satan, the father of lies. Yes. Now, so, so let's get back to Adam and Eve. And let's really think about, hmm, if I was Adam and Eve, what choice would I have made? So at this time, Miss Heather is going to share with you some thoughts that God has about lying. What does God have to say all through the Bible about lying? Proverbs 6, 19, the first part of that verse says, God hates a false witness that speaketh lies. Psalm chapter 101, verse 7 says, He that worketh deceit, that word means trickery, people who trick you, shall not dwell, that means shall not live within my house. That means heaven. He that telleth lies shall not tarry, that means shall not be allowed to stay in my sight with me. That's what God thinks about lying. 1 John 2, 4. He that saith, I know him, that's Jesus, who is God, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Ephesians 4, verse 25. The first part of that verse says, Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Be a truth keeper and a truth speaker, not a liar. And then, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8b, the second part of the verse says, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This fire keeps on burning and burning and burning, boys and girls, and people do not die in hell, even though it is like a continual death, but you actually never die in hell. So who will be able to live in heaven? Well, I'm sorry. 
So who will not be able to live in heaven? Anyone who is lost in their sin and not willing to turn away from sin. Anyone who does not believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord will not go to heaven. So how does the Bible describe the life of those who are not saved? Well, let's look at this verse again. It describes these, these Satan followers. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, these are people who do not believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. The abominable, that means people that do hateful things that God hates. Murderers, those are people that go around killing like Hamas. Warmongers, people who are not married but they want to live like married people. And sorcerers, those are people who do witchcraft and Satanism and cast evil spells. And idolaters, those are people who worship false gods like idols. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which the Bible calls the second death. The first death is when we die and we're laid in the casket and our bodies put under the ground. But your soul, the part of you that lives forever, is going to go right away to either heaven or hell. So, and then our body, if you're saved, is going to be made into a new body on the way up at the rapture when we meet Jesus. But all the people that are left behind for the terrible seven years of tribulation and hell um, after the rest of the end times, after they go to the judgment, those people's bodies will also be rejoined for that resurrection to stand before God at the great white throne judgment and then cast into the lake of fire forever. So we don't want to go there. So how can I go to heaven? How can I have my name written in God's big book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life? How can I go to be with Jesus forever? How can I have my sins cleaned up and forgiven? How can I get rid of this guilt and shame, this heavy burden I feel on me? And let's also find out who will be able to go to heaven. Let's think about it. Revelation 21 verse 7 says, He that overcometh, that means God is um, going to let you inherit heaven if you're saved. And God will give you all things there that you want. It says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son or daughter so if you ask God to save you, he will. He will not turn anyone away. Some of you might say, oh, I just don't think God could ever forgive me for what I have done. It's too bad. No, don't believe that lie. God says he is not willing that any should perish. That means go to hell. But that all should come to repentance. That means turn away from sin and turn to Jesus as your Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is eternal life. So it's so easy that any child can come to God today. Remember learning your ABCs at home with mommy and daddy, or maybe you learned them in school? Well, each of those first three letters of the 26 letters in our alphabet mean something very important. So let me share it with you at this time. A reminds us to admit. So A reminds us to admit that I have sinned and you have sinned. So each one of us need to come before God and say, yes, I am in agreement with you. I have sinned. Romans 3.10 tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember how Adam and Eve lost their light, that Shekinah glory of God when they sinned? And then we all 
have been born with sinful blood ever since then? Yes, we have all come short of the glory of God's holiness. B, B reminds us to believe that Jesus died. He spilled out his precious sinless blood on the cross to wash away my sins and your sins. He took my place with the punishment that I deserved. He will forgive me when I believe on him and when I ask him. And then he rose again to prove that he is God. Yes, he still has the nail prints in his hands and in his feet and the sword marks, the piercing marks in his side. He is alive in heaven today. Yes, God says to all of us that when he flew back up into heaven, ascended back up into heaven, he said, I'm going to leave the comforter with you. That's the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to heaven to prepare beautiful mansions for you. And you're going to come and join me someday if you believe on me. That's right. So Romans 10 verses 9, 10, and 13 tell us what we need to believe in because B is for belief. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Yes, he wants to be your Lord. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou, meaning you, shall be saved. For with the heart, God is concerned about your heart. Not just saying, I believe in my head. But Believing in your heart means you're really willing to turn away from your sin and let God clean up your life. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That means you believe that God can help you to do what is right. And you want to turn away from your wrong, from your sin, from your darkness, from your guilt, from your shame. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then this tells us that God loves all the people in the world. Of course, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not go to hell, but instead have everlasting life that is in heaven with Jesus. So, the Bible tells us that with God there's no difference between one person and the next it says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich. That means he's merciful unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So A stands for admit I'm a sinner. B stands believe that Jesus wants to be your Lord and Savior and that he died and spilled out his blood to wash away your sins. And then C reminds us that I need to confess my sin and I also need to confess or be in agreement with God that Jesus is God and he wants to be Lord over every part of my life. He wants to write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life today. So if you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, the God of all truth, you can be saved today. And I would love for you to be saved today. Isaiah 43 verse 11 tells us, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me is no Savior. So no other person on earth that calls themselves God or a God can save you because we all are sinners. The only one who has never sinned is the Lord 
God, the Lord Jesus, who created this entire universe and all the people in the world, and you and me. So I wanted that to be very clear before we pray, that we have to be willing to trust in the Lord God, the one and only true God, the living God, the spirit of truth, the true witness. So at this time, if you have never been saved before, let me invite you to ask Jesus to clean up your life and to help you so that you can have hope in God and so that you can know for sure when you die that you will go to heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit I have sinned. B. I believe that you are the Lord Jesus. B. I believe that you died and rose again for me. Please forgive me of my sin. Please save me with your cleansing blood. And C. I confess I am in agreement with you. Yes. I confess my sin and I confess Jesus as Lord. Please write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and please help me to live all of my days for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Boys and girls, I am so excited for you if you decided to get saved today. That was the best choice you could ever make in your life. You know, boys and girls, the Bible says that when one sinner turns away from sin and asks Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, all the angels are rejoicing in heaven. And if today was the day of your salvation, then God just wrote your name in his big book in heaven, the Lamb's Book of Life. So please let Miss Heather know if you got saved today so that I can truly indeed rejoice with you and pray with you that God will show you now how to live for him all of your days. So the exciting thing is, is that when we get saved, God gives us the power to be overcomers. Yes. And let's look at one more verse. Before we close, Revelation 22, verse 14. This verse explains who will be allowed to eat from the tree of life in heaven. It says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city won't that be wonderful if you got saved today that when you go to heaven jesus says welcome my child i love you i'm so happy you got saved enter into the joy of my kingdom and to be able to see jesus and to see all the saints all the christians from all the years of being in this world the saints of all the ages like even all the Old Testament saints, like Adam and Eve and Moses and Ruth and Daniel and all these wonderful people that we are going to meet in heaven, boys and girls. Well, we have a lot of exciting times ahead of us if we got saved. Or maybe if you have already been saved. Yes, you have a very bright future. Well, I want to thank you for connecting with Hope in God Bible Club today. It's time to close. And today, I would love to know your names. And I would love to hear about what country you're from. And maybe how we have helped you today or maybe sometime in the past. Or you might even have some questions that you might want to send to Miss Heather in an email. I would love to answer your questions. 
So at this time, I would like to tell you that I love each and every one of you, and I pray for all of you every day. And I want to remind you, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And share the good news that we teach here at Hope in God Bible Club so that others may hear. So, you can find us on these two channels. On our YouTube channel, and we are also on an uncensored channel called Bit Shoot. So, there are the channels right there. And I'll bring that a little closer to the camera. So at this time, I want to say bye to each and every one of you. Thanks again for joining me. And God bless each and every one of you and your families.